morning glory Say there, stop that yawning A brand new day is dawning Pull up the shade and let the sun come through Good morning glory Spend about an hour Underneath the shower And keep on singing like the birdies do Books of the Week Back on the air And uh, we're fired up here at uh, Books of the Week Central Here in the main offices of uh, Books of the Week Towers <laughs> Not sure how much more I can build this up. So I'll just kick it over to our great, our luminous, our wonderful book critic, Steve Donahue in Boston. Good morning. Hello, everybody. I did not know that uh, Books of the Week Central was one foot away from the container of donuts and two feet away from tonight's ground chuck for the tacos. There we are, folks. You can barely see them. These are known as Boston cream filled. They call them. Um, they call them Pershings here, and I, I I know there's a general Pershing, so I don't know if it was named after him or what. Uh, what's going on there? But uh, I um, I don't feel like a general after eating one this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I get through basic. So watching this on YouTube and thinking that package looks like a wild bear got at it. That's how they eat in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> they don't sit around in Wisconsin. If your winter lasts 10 months, you'd eat that way too. <laughs> <laughs> the only way in, Steve, was to chew my way in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I've never known it otherwise. Well, I've, I've been to Wisconsin many, many times. And you, you're talking with normal seeming people about normal seeming things. And then they, I say, well, I'd like some lemonade. They say it's in the fridge. I open the fridge and the packages are ripped apart and torn into. <laughs> There's a different way to do it. That is what you're saying. Okay. I'll take that under consideration. Yeah. The, the normal educational route for Wisconsinites that in eighth grade, you learn about something called utensils. There's another way. <laughs> Well, if you have time after the show, Steve, I would like to go into training for your Jedi, these Jedi things you're talking about. <laughs> but until, until then, we're going to talk about books here on this uh, lovely little show. We like to talk about uh, nonfiction, a nonfiction selection of Steve's choosing, um, and then a fiction choosing, uh, a fiction selection of Steve's choosing. I've done this before, I swear. And then after that, we do something called a wild card, which uh, today will be remarkably... I don't know, uh, normal. Uh, the normies out there will say, this show might be okay, actually. <laughs> they have to get through the rest of the show to get to it. I doubt there'll be anyone unconvinced by then. Well, you know, uh, this woman sent in a picture uh, to remind us uh, that... <laughs> 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 She's well, ready. <laughs> it's worth reminding our listeners and our viewers especially that when we post pictures of these ladies, we understand, we understand that we love them. Oh, absolute they're adoration. The salt of the earth. They're also the salt of they're the backbone of any library in the world. Absolutely. They're Absolutely. the ones who get it made. They're the ones who keep it going. And it, we just like to live dangerously by poking fun at them, <laughs> even though they can actually kill you by looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing with them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there we go <laughs> how's that um so steve our first uh selection of the day let's head to the nonfiction department shall we Nonfiction is a memoir by dr fauci who is one of the only medical professionals anywhere in the country who needs no introduction it's his he wrote a memoir on call he, he's uh, one of the few medical professionals in this country too who needs 24-hour security 24-hour security largely because of the fascist wing of the u.s government which is better than half the U.S. government, uh, that does what fascist movements always do. In fascist rule, bad things never happen. They're done to you. And they're not done to you by random circumstance. They're done to you by a person or people. If you have a fascist ruler, he is not going to tell the populace that a massively contagious, deadly pathogen originated in China. He's going to call it the China pathogen and say that China did it. He's going to say that it was done to him. Right. Not to you, to him. And the same thing is true with the fascist wing when it comes to Dr. Fauci. If he's out there sanely advocating public health steps as the information grows. So at the beginning, he's advocating one protocol. When information is increased, he, he modifies that protocol. And of course... He is advocating what became known colloquially as the Fauci ouchie. Of course, he's advocating widespread vaccination. 
Sure. If he's doing that, then if you're a fascist in the United States House of Representatives, he's going to be the bad guy. He's going to be a villain that you can put a, a name and face to. Yeah. Fascists out. can't stand when impersonal forces happen. That's why the worst thing that can happen to you in the world, even worse than being in a fascist regime, is to be in a fascist regime when an earthquake strikes. Right. <laughs> right. Something like that. Because the, the, the leader, capital L, will view it as a personal affront to himself. Sure, sure. You say that this thing is more powerful than he is. Right. The the earthquake was not part of the plan. Right. So <laughs> what they will do, because they can't do anything about the actual reality of the earthquake, they will downplay it. Yeah. And people will die as a result. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It, 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 you saw a perfect example of this in a recent hearing in the House of Representatives. I don't know how many of our viewers watch clips of these things, but one of the fascist members of the House of Representatives insisted publicly on the record on not calling Dr. Fauci doctor. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Fauci and said you belong in prison and had to be called up short on a point of order. Surely it is not against the surely this house is not going to deny credentials to someone just because they don't like them. And that record had to be corrected. Yeah. Uh, but this is this is this book, it's dryly written, it's poorly written. It's, hmm. it's a perfect example of the kind of public persona memoir that should never be written. Oh boy. Okay. It's just a you got a book deal. People got a yeah. you know, you've got money on the table. You maybe want to redress your side of the story, although these books almost never do that. They're almost mm -hmm. never polemic. Uh, so, so you're saying as a uh, author, uh, Dr. Fauci is a great physician. Yes. <laughs> as an author, he's a great physician. No. He has uh, fewer of the normal qualities that we associate with doctors. He's not a raving, frothing at the mouth megalomaniac, for instance. Yeah. Uh, he's not a rampant, raging sexist, for instance. Uh, he seems to have a longer record of being right than being wrong, for instance. If I were a publisher, I'd be like, mm, I'm not hearing a lot of money here, Steve. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so, in that sense, you, it's not. <laughs> He's not saying that he personally makes the sunrise in the morning. I've read doctor mm -hmm. memoirs that started with that. <laughs> uh, but, and also, this book will be an introduction to a lot of readers who might not know how far back Dr. Fauci's public service goes in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a yeah. lot of us who knew his name before COVID. That we knew his name because of AIDS. Sure. Uh, that will be interesting. Of course, it's his view of things. What we, what yeah. we need is uh, in 2015. 41 or something for someone to write a, a biography of him yeah yeah uh but that's not going to happen so so this is we're going to have to take this instead sure uh so I, I don't know would the library ever get a book like this oh oh i believe we have two as we speak really? uh yeah without a doubt it's uh there's interest um i, I must tell this tale um a couple years back i want to say maybe it's probably been two years now we had no intention of getting a book that was published called by some <laughs> Joe's Garage uh, publisher called The Real Dr. Fauci. We had no intention of getting it because immediately you could tell that just by the fact that they brazenly called it The Real, we knew it wasn't. <laughs> so, but we had great interest we had uh in fact to the point where some patrons were saying aha see we knew about libraries you have an agenda they love that so we bought it and it did okay and every time it checked out we all kind of our shoulders slumped and i made this noise huh. but um <laughs> yeah so yeah we had to get it it's a <clears throat> there are a handful of publishers that will do this regnery being one of the big ones where the the book that any publisher should say, no, we won't do this. We have our <laughs> reputation to think of. There's a handful of publishers that will do it. And when you talk to them, on the occasions when they go on camera and talk about it, they will just press a button and they will they will issue the usual nauseating First Amendment, people have a right to express themselves. Sure. Stuff. Uh, the books like The Real Dr. Fauci will talk a lot about Wuhan. They'll talk a lot about mm. game of function research. They'll talk a lot about whether or not Dr. Fauci personally earmarked funds to weaponize natural COVID-2 SARS viruses in order to find out how they work. And that one of those souped up viruses actually got out into the public. The so-called lab leak hypothesis. Right, right. The, the, 
might be interesting to talk about on its own, but it's never talked about on its own. It's always talked about with this cloak and dagger <laughs> right, Doctor right. Doom type thing, and that right. that ruins it. Right. Yeah. There's no a, way that I mean, this book, of course, gives you the impression of a selfless public servant. And it's going to. It has to, of course. Yeah. But there's there's no way that you can look at his record and not also come to the conclusion of a fairly selfless public servant. Men, mensch. I mean, I never come away with anything other than, you know, at, at a minimum, I guess I can't say that about him personally, but I will say that professionally he's a mensch. I mean, you know, he, he showed up and I think he even stayed late. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. So uh, it, it'd be it'd be great for me to know that there were at least as many people interested in this book as were interested in things like the real Doctor Fauci. Mm -hmm. That that would be great to know. Uh, more, I would say more. Although again, I'm also fearful that uh, half of the holds and the pretty you know voluminous hold list, I think half of them are like, okay, where can we get him? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we're combing like, through this text. Where is he lying? Where is the, where is the documentary evidence against him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, My, I. I will say I will conclude two things about this book. One is that your patrons shouldn't go into it expecting a good reading experience because mm -hmm. they're not going to get it. It's as boring as dirt. <laughs> uh, and two isn't really connected with the book, although it was on my mind when I finished it, which is God help us if we ever need Dr. Fauci again. And we are certainly going to need Dr. Fauci again. Yeah, we, yeah. We're certainly going to need a sane voice of reason at the front of the whole public messaging. Sure, sure. Whether this bird flu that has now taken human lives, whether mm -hmm. this bird flu is the thing or whether it's something else, you know it's coming. Yeah, yeah, something something we can't even fathom. I mean, you know, we're talking Andromeda strain type stuff coming down the pike, so who it knows? It might not be as bad as COVID-19, but... Yeah. <sighs> the, the, the universe will out. <laughs> That's for sure. So, well, that's the, uh, that is the Dr. Fauci book uh, available at the Cedarburg Public Library. And I bet it's available at some other libraries too, but I don't know anything about that. Uh, so wherever you live, uh, until C Cedarburg Library franchises, you're stuck with your own public library. <laughs> <laughs> um, we like to uh, work our way over to the fiction department. Before we do, um, I want to let everyone know that we do have a new sponsor this week. I'm pretty excited about it. We have a, a underwriter, I guess I have to say. We are a nonprofit. Uh, look at these wonderful cons. Now, cons, you can see the difference. You can taste the difference. And the part that I'm really interested in, you can feel the difference. <laughs> so that's cons. The wiener, the world awaited. Is that good English, Steve? I don't know. The wiener, the world awaited. <laughs> I'm not sure. Should we should we traumatize our our loyal viewers even more than usual by adopting as a tagline for this show, you can feel the difference? <laughs> I want to actually say our tagline is the we did, the we did the world awaited, but that's just I don't me. know how much more they can take. I really don't. <laughs> well, you know, they are getting a little surly. <laughs> oh, my God. You're hitting us with these images of these ladies that we both love. <laughs> we just have to hope. We have, we're on thin ice. We have to hope that they can take a joke. I, I not think... the people you want to tease off at all. I think they love us, too, but I, and that's why they care. That's why they're actually... <laughs> It's saying, boys, <laughs> behave. <laughs> All right. So here we are behaving by introducing this week's fiction title, Steve. Yes. A little bit of a rarity, a little bit of an oddity, something I wouldn't imagine the library would have on order. This is a, a deluxe hardcover edition of the various comic book adventures that bring together the two superhero comic book universes, DC Comics and Marvel Comics. You know, this is bipartisanship at its best. <laughs> it was for a long time, it was thought to be impossible. It was thought, no way, absolutely not. But once the heads, once the, the publishers of both companies started swapping places, it suddenly seemed more possible. And in the 1970s, as in so many other cases, the impossible became reality. <laughs> and the two, at the time, most popular comic book characters of all time, most popular superhero comic book characters of all time. Sure. Superman and Spider-Man teamed up. Batman does not Batman does not approve this message, but go ahead. No, well, at the time, <laughs> at the time Batman was in limbo. He wasn't ah. he hadn't he hadn't yet been fully reinvented as okay. a, a dark creature of the night <laughs> played by a sparkly vampire. Right. Uh, he hadn't yet at the time and, and 
overall as well. Fans love to say, you know, Batman books are the only ones that sell, but everyone knows Superman. Uh, just because he's been done poorly on the big screen multiple times doesn't <laughs> yes. mean he isn't a great, a better character. But in this, <laughs> this was a larger comic book. It was more expensive. And it in it, Superman and Spider-Man team up. Hmm. Uh, first, they have the requisite fight. If any of you, any of our viewers are not familiar with superhero team up. <laughs> oh, no. First, they have <laughs> oh, no. And, they, and the fight goes exactly as you'd expect it. <laughs> and then they team up against the machinations of Dr. Octopus, a hmm. Spider-Man villain, and hmm. Lex Luthor. Ah. <laughs> uh, and it was wonderful. Fans loved it. A certain fan in the American Midwest bought it and loved it. And <laughs> it showed both companies that this could happen. Yeah. Uh, the original Spider-Man and Superman team up is a little bit, I think, underrated. Hmm. Because a lot of the Marvel and DC team ups that came after it are not good. And there's a little bit of backfilling there. The original one is has some sublime moments to it. Hmm. Just sublime moment to it. Uh, uh, Probably my favorite little moment being at the end when Lex Luthor is proceeding with his gigantic plan to annihilate the Earth. And Dr. Octopus, <laughs> who's from Hoboken, says, what do you mean? <laughs> annihilate the Earth? I live there. It's a perfect example of the difference in scale between Marvel Comics and DC Comics. Lex doesn't care that he's not going to have a place to live. I, I would think Lex would have to say to Doc Ock, this is what you get for missing staff meetings. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, the, this was such a success that it was followed by a sequel mm. in which Superman and Spider-Man team up, yes, but we also get a couple of other characters. We get the Hulk mm. for Marvel Comics, and we get Wonder Woman uh, for DC Comics. Wonder Woman and Spider-Man team up, the Hulk and Superman team up, but not before they fight. <laughs> the Hulk, of course, can't do anything to Superman. But we need a better level of hero. If they can't, you know, on their initial... If they can't meet cute... <laughs> Well, it's wrong, it's wrong with these people. people. Meet cute, but only because the writer couldn't get rid of sexism. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> yes. you, can't have, uh, they, you can't have Spider-Man fighting a, a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he instead of fighting Wonder Woman when they meet, he shuts off the lights. Now he has his spider sense, so he can navigate in the dark. Oh, he says, "Oh, well, you're really your enemy? I'd be, I'd be." punching the daylights out of you right now. And when a certain fan read that, when it first came out in an oversized paperback, that fan said, well, a lot of good it would do you. <laughs> you can punch until you're 100 years old. It wouldn't, it wouldn't do you any good. And also, doesn't Wonder Woman's last so glow? Uh, but that second issue was worse. It was it was a little boring. No. Uh, and then it kept going. Hmm. The two, uh, for instance, team phenomenon books one for each company, the X-Men and the Teen Titans, they teamed up oh. with great artwork. And it, that was very, very enjoyable. And it, it went on a little further. At one point, the comics companies even merged to create weird uh, a roster of weird new combined characters. Wow, I didn't know that. I had no, I was not unaware of that piece of history. The pinnacle of everything was the, something that had been 35 years in the making, which is for the Justice League, the DC Comics super team, and the Avengers the Marvel Comics super team to first fight and then team up. And that, <laughs> yes. that four-parter was wonderful and huh. they have been collected over time, never with Justice League and Avengers together. Okay. The other comics have been collected over time and this deluxe edition, is it's, it's big, it's ornate, it's got, uh, I think, a new introduction. Uh, and I, It sounds expensive. It's expensive, <laughs> yeah. These big hard <laughs> things are expensive. Yeah, You're, but you've... In their defense, I don't usually defend expensive books, but in their defense, you only make a thing like this when you already know that people have loved it for decades. Sure, sure. So that yeah. it's the expense is warranted on their part. You're mm -hmm. not, it's not a bar to that. Probably that original oversized Superman and Spider Man comic would be expensive now. It's behind yeah. me in this video no. shot. But it, <laughs> it probably like a pristine copy of that would be expensive now, but this thing is expensive yeah. because these things are popular. Yeah. Yeah, but I have to wonder. I have to ask you: Would this ever come to the library system? Well, so I um, <laughs> surely I, it would be crazy. It would be torn apart. 
Well, yes and no. Uh, I will say uh, Cedarburg has a, uh, a higher level of patrons, so we're very delicate here. Um, but um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> you mean there's all the dirt, don't you? <laughs> you don't want to put it that way. I would never. Um, I wouldn't because she's keeping an eye on me. <laughs> That's so. what I thought. That's what I thought. However, um, I have increased our graphic novel section, as they call it now, you know, and that's how I can convince uh, those in charge that um, there's a reason to buy hero funny books, <laughs> as I call them, graphic novels. Uh, and I've increased the, and they're doing really well. I have this actually beautiful little quasi comic book shop feel to that section now where they're all facing out. And I like to visit during the day when I get a little stressed, you know, maybe if someone says, I can't make copies on your machine, I will walk over to the graphic novel section and just go, ah. But um, <laughs> that being said, I have to be careful if I start buying uber expense. That's why I asked. Um, I can usually pull off one very expensive graphic novel tome per year. This might be it. I will say I haven't, you know, cracked that egg just yet. But it sounds like this would be one worthwhile because it is pretty. Like you said, there's some history here, and it's pretty there's a lot of crossover appeal between yeah. all of the real good superheroes and all of the dumb Marvel superheroes. Sure. Who are all made by radiation and who are all in Freudian therapy. <laughs> like us, Steve. <laughs> well, now that you'd be less susceptible to all that stress if you didn't start every day with four Boston cream pie donuts. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> like the Green Lantern who has to uh, put his ring. <laughs> this is, this is me. Where are my power? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go right in. <laughs> So God, yes. to hold the case so lovingly too. <laughs> so if it tips, your whole body language changes. <laughs> if it tips, the upper frosting will cling to the top, and then it's not so. Okay. Um. Anyway. Um. No more fetishizing my breakfast. Um. Yes. Um. I think I'm gonna look into this one and see what um my uh uh my distributor's cost is through Baker and Taylor, and if it's if I can. I might be able to pull this one off. I think you're you're you're, work, you're working on me. <laughs> so, got a lot so of stuff. yeah, well done. All right, cool. And also, well, it bridges the divide if you if you've got comic book. I don't think you do, but if you've got comic book fans who are only DC fans, as they should be, uh, then <laughs> you know they're gonna they wouldn't be interested. But they the DC comics characters yeah. are in here, uh, and Marvel comics characters are in here too, agonizing over the, the you know the, what the kind of bread you're laying down, man. <laughs> it's 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 interesting because actually, if you're going to meet a comic cultist, um, they do seem to be be more Marvel based. Like DC fans, oh, yeah. I will say, seem slightly more well adjusted. Yeah. A present company excluded, of course, but um, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> um, but yes, uh, the I Marvel fans fancy box for my morning frost and cream pie. <laughs> he had I went to the Dunkin' Donuts on the corner, and since it's in Boston. <laughs> I actually had to say, don't you want to be wearing gloves when you handle that food? <laughs> he looked over his shoulder at me and said, what, are you from New York? <laughs> oh, boy. The, the mean streets of Duncan. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the Marvel fans have a kind of a, a sheen in their eyes uh, when they come in looking for Marvel titles, whereas DC fans, uh, you know, what's cool about DC fans is they're more street. They come in, they're like, hey, you got that uh, DC title there? Whereas Marvel fans are like, I need Doctor Strange. <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's a DC title that you should get. Yes? New Frontier. Something oh. called New Frontier. Okay. If there's a hardcover of that. It's not super expensive. And yeah. Oh my! I bet it would be popular. Okay, I'll I'll look into that because I'm I'm looking to uh, spend a little uh, graphic novel coin this week actually. So I will I will give that a look. All right. Well, that is our I'll two. Email you about it. What's that? I'll email you about it. Oh please, yes, yeah, that's great. That'll uh, I'll I can include lots of pictures. Some link frontier. <laughs> <laughs> Now see here. <laughs> These ladies just spend the whole time saying, will you boys behave? And if you've noticed, the comment sections of our videos on YouTube are entirely full of will you boys. <laughs> I, I'm waiting for to get that one saying, I will fly to Wisconsin and Boston if I have to. 
<laughs> so there we are. So this is the time of the show where we like to uh, bend and twist and writhe and jitterbug. <laughs> so <laughs> this is called the wild card section. Uh, not so wild today, Steve, since I don't have my uh, voluminous CPL collection in front of me here in my house yet. Um, <laughs> I don't have something behind you either. <laughs> yes, I don't have nothing offensive. Unless, of course, you're going to tell me and all of our viewers that your kitchen is actually the Jack Hankey Memorial Kitchen. <laughs> he does have naming rights. <laughs> so, yes. Um, however, uh, I thought it would be fun today. We've never done this before, and maybe we'll never do it again, uh, to look at the top five titles, both fiction and nonfiction hardcover, on a list called this little list called the New York Times bestsellers. I thought this would be a hoot. And I know Steve will have opinions. And in actuality, if we have time, and I think we do, we do need to break down the fact that the New York Times bestseller list has, it's not Casey Kasem's top 40. This has nothing to do with capitalism, commerce, or sales, does it, Steve? Does it? Times list are you thinking of? <laughs> well, no, I, I no, no, I should say, I should say, it's not the, how much money Barnes and Noble as a company pays to the New York Times. Every this week. is what I mean. No, people, people look at it and say, oh, this is the top selling book, and that is not a truism, is it? Or is it? Not a truism. No, but the Times is famously murky about how they aggregate their list. <laughs> See, they're famously dodgy about it. They will not answer whether or not, for instance, there's any payola involved. If you walk into a big Barnes & Noble bookstore, you've got the new release tables, the very first thing you will see, and it's full of new releases. And up until just comparatively recently, I think it might have changed now with the new ownership, mm -hmm. but until just comparatively recently, for decades, the books that were on that table were paid to be there. Yes. The publishers were paid to put them there. So Absolutely. they were not at all. It was not organic at all. Yeah. And I doubt that the New York Times bestseller list is fully organic. But it's such an institution that I have to believe it's not fully rigged either. Okay. That's, well, that's a weird place to be. <laughs> weird place to be. I, I mean, there are, every year there are people who put forward what seem to be documented evidence of a book that is selling really, really well. That is not on the Times list. Right, right. For whatever reason. The, the people who put forward the evidence always put forward a reason as well. Usually it's that the Times is trying to squelch conservative bestsellers. <laughs> the real Dr. Fauci is not number one. How is this possible? Right. right. And when you look <laughs> into the sales figures for the real Dr. Fauci or for Donald Trump Jr.'s memoir, no, you, you realize that the sales figures aren't there at all. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it shouldn't be there. And also that's, that's one objection that I have to people who say that it's rigged against conservative sure. voices. And the other objection that I want to make when people say that is, have you read the rest of the Times lately? <laughs> they don't object to the conservative view. Right, right, absolutely. The New York Times has massive heat waves in half of uh, of Indonesia. Yeah, It has the, all of Europe tilting politically to the arch right. It has a presidential debate in the offing. And in today's New York Times, I think there are 30, maybe 31 articles about how old Joe Biden is. Oh boy. <laughs> so, it's not exactly a liberal paper. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, All right. Well, you know, the Times list is an institution. I'd love to know from you how influential it is at the library. It, that is, <laughs> um, it is influential enough that we uh, have a printout of that list that gets refreshed once a week when you are greeted upstairs uh, in our uh, fiction and nonfiction sections. So as people are curious, they some and I do have some patrons who will stop and look and say, all right, what am I reading this week? Um, really? So, yes. That's <laughs> worth a patrons only conversation. Right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's take a look. I am doing something technically interesting and different this week. Look at that. We got it right here. That is the. Uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I paid my bills this week, Steve. <laughs> and you will notice that number one on the. They were looking at the. For Cedarburg, paved roads? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's great is that actually we got running water. <laughs> So uh, paper roads are just around the corner. We're looking They're at the non running water once those Dunkin' Donuts act up. I can tell you that, pal, oh mine. 
<laughs> um, those things one whole package at a time i'm telling you this portion size i i think dr fauci would agree and uh, luckily yes <laughs> dr fauci is number one here and i want to stress something i wish i didn't have to say that's hate buying yeah uh, the fact that he's number one is hate buying a lot of it is hate buying a lot of people in this country i'm not meaning to sell it short Probably 100 million people in this country realize that either they or someone they love owes their life to the same steadfast mm-hmm. advice of Dr. Fauci, of this one person yeah, pu- putting up with all kinds of institutional abuses. Imagine yeah. how hard it must be to be him when you're trying to speak common sense health measures in yeah. a Trump administration. Absolutely. Oh, God. I mean, awful. Yeah, nevertheless, yeah. although a lot of people know that, that they or the, someone they love owes their life to this guy. That status on the New York Times list is hate buying. Mm. That's people buying this thing because they want to tear it to pieces. Want well, to if, I, if I were Dustin Moskowitz, I would turn to Marjorie and say, I don't think they would give Mr. Fauci a book contract, but they sure gave Dr. Fauci one. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs> uh, well, the first response that came to my mind was, if your argument is that you lose your title if you act disgracefully, then why are we still calling you representative? <laughs> right. When you are a braying donkey in fact that's an insult. if you go on tiktok or youtube you can see all sorts of clips of braying donkeys who are actually wonderful they're, actually they're really nice yeah <laughs> they're kind of endearing aren't they <laughs> well it looks at like number two uh something called the uh war on warriors by pete hegseth um and uh, i believe he's a fox and friends host so what do you got for me steve <laughs> well <laughs> is this hate buying too <laughs> the problem with well it is hate buying but it's hating other things. Other things. Yes. Other things. The problem with the Times list, the thing that makes me think it has not been co-opted by the fascist wing of American politics is that so much of it now is ideologically driven. Yeah. So once upon a time, 30 years ago, you could look at the Times bestseller list and get a sense of what was at least genuinely popular in bookstores. And maybe if you go back 60 years, what was good? Mm-hmm. Some of what was good. Now, the war on warriors is an explicitly crackpot political thing. It, it, it says that the, the the underlying message is that the the weak code word gay Democrats hate mm-hmm. our our boys and girls in blue. Mm-hmm. They, they hate our warriors. They hate our service people. They do not thank them for their service. We, we, th- we thank those guys on the Capitol steps. We were really grateful to them. <clears throat> it's, it's objectively insane to impute that to someone with Joe Biden's presidential record, yeah. much less Joe Biden's personal past. It's it's just objectively insane to say that, but they do. Uh, I can say to your patrons, especially the ones who consult this list, that uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, on call is boring and you don't have time to read boring books. No one has time to read boring books. <laughs> War on Warriors is boring, but also not worth your time. You should just avoid it. Mm -hmm. Even if you think that the current administration somehow does not value its its service people. Yeah. Which is insane. It is insane. Uh, Legislation designed to help veterans, and he did it over the unified objections of the fascist party in his own government. Exactly, yes. members Members of Biden's family served. I mean... Yeah, it's... This this is just propaganda. It's best avoided. Uh, We're going to avoid it. Although, unfortunately, if we believe this list, a lot of people are not. So there we are. Um, number three. I, that, this is great. I, I want to see, because I'm going to do the top five of 15 that they list. I want to see if there's one that, that Steve approves of. And I'm not sure we're going to pull this off. Uh, number five is called The Anxious Generation. Uh, this is by Jonathan Haidt. Um, H A I D T, not H A T. That's not how you pronounce his name. But Height. until he stops being a public scold, it's perfectly fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very lucrative deal to be a public scold, but if you're going to be a public scold, then you know, if you're going to be the lady in Game of Thrones yelling shame, 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 <laughs> then we can call you anything we want. Absolutely. If you, if you serve it up. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I have to assume you may have at least thumbed through this. I know okay. you're. He's a serious okay. writer. And this is a seriously thought-provoking book, although it's cod swallow. It's a gigantic <laughs> slopping bucket of nonsense. It's still a thought-provoking book, especially uh, your patrons who are parents of especially teenage kids, but now sure. it's younger. 
kids kids yeah. are on their screens and fluent with screen technology when they're yeah. four or five, unless you specifically guard them against it. They they are incredibly fluent with it. And by the time they get to be 10 or 11, I'm not saying 16 or 17 or 18, <laughs> right, right. by the time they get to be 10 or 11, their voyages in that world would simply horrify their parents. Oh, boy. Simply yeah. Horrify. And there are no exceptions. There are no yeah. goody two-shoes kids. When you're 10, <laughs> you want to know the five places on that tablet of yours that you absolutely shouldn't go. And you don't want to know that to avoid them. Right. You want to know that to go to them. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan, Jonathan Haight <laughs> is not talking here about... I want to issue that just as a public service. If you think your kids are doing the internet safely, you're wrong. Yeah. They aren't. No matter yeah. what, they aren't. The key thing is, though, if you talk to your kids... Oh, we can't do that, Steve. No. <laughs> it's, it's a revolutionary thing that I actually recommend to parents. If you talk to your kids, you'll see that they're just fine. They're just fine. So although they have been to places on the internet that you don't know about and that yeah. would absolutely horrify them, right. would horrifies you as an adult, right. Right. they're just fine. They're not losing the moral compass that you are giving them. They just want to know what's out there. It's their world. They should explore. Sure. Jonathan Haidt doesn't want that. He's He's... Standing athwart the the tracks of change, saying, "You know, unplug, unplug." <laughs> he wow! That online devices and screen time are making a wreck, a hash of our kids. That's not true. Yeah, there's not much reliable data on this, but the reliable mm -hmm. data that there is suggests that the fact that 95 percent of people aged 10 to 15 report serious psychological problems is, in fact, a fad. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a social contagion. That's all. Sure, sure. The numbers probably haven't gone much up at all. And if they've gone up at all, they've gone up probably from the fact that these kids between the ages of 10 and 15 are eating one pound of microplastics every day. Yeah. <laughs> That's bound to upset your body chemistry a lot more than whether or not you're watching a salacious TikTok dance. You know, the plastics. That in here are. A friend of mine who works for uh, the National Health Institute, when you show him a package like that, yeah. say, how much of this plastic do you think is getting into these donuts? He says it's all plastic. Oh, God. It's just in different forms. If you know how this stuff is made, it's all plastic. I'm joining the anxious generation, Steve. Well, I hate here in this book. I don't think that his motives are completely evil. Although a large part of his motives now is to secure talking head spots on TV. And that, oh, is, sure. that, yeah. that is just attention for attention's sake. And that, that means that you will say what, if you're willing to do that, that means that you are open to the suggestion that you are saying things just to get attention. And once that suggestion is there, no one should listen to you. <laughs> well, well, that's what we do here, though. <laughs> We're the exception. We're the exception. And uh, my phone's not ringing. We do this and I'm waiting. <laughs> All of our attention is negative. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> we love you, Ma. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, Mama. So, um, <laughs> this book is obviously aimed at parents. I yeah. don't think if you gave this book to, to a 16 year old to read, I think they would laugh uproariously at it. <laughs> I, really, I think they were considered uh, as out of touch as the ex World War II vet, yeah, buzz cut Marine dad of the <laughs> 1950s trying to understand his 16 year old kid. <laughs> they were considered completely out of touch, right? Right, they were suck, like, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> right. They agree with, with the part about how they've, they've got it worse than any other generation because we're raising a generation of kids addicted to self pity, but sure. not because of any of the reasons that he says. Well, well we know I, what that reason is you're an adult with kids. Right, right. We we know that that reason is is um you know they blame the internet, they're blaming uh, the microplastics. They can blame whatever they want. I fear that the reason these kids are so jittery might be because of their parents who are reading books like this. <laughs> well, there are a whole bunch of factors involved. I mean, there all of the kids in this age bracket have been giving mood altering medication since they were four or five. Sure, none yeah. of that medication is vetted. No, no long term studies have ever been done on it. But the pharmacists and doctors who created and marketed and then prescribed it are all, all have unpaid uh, <laughs> vacations to Tahiti for three right. weeks by, made by the, the creators of Big Pharma. Absolutely. Has created this, this, an epidemic like this. Yeah. And another reason for the overwrought nature of this generation might be how badly they've been rooked over by my generation. <laughs> 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 They only have yeah. to look around to see no one that if you're in the eighth grade now, you are never going to own a home. 
No, no, no. You're, you're, on, you're going to live most of your year in triple reinforced climate protection bunkers against yes. the out of control <laughs> climate catastrophe that yeah. my generation created and then sustained. <laughs> you're, you're going to be paying $10.50 for a loaf of bread, and you know all that. Right, so, right. But you know, in that bunker, Steve, I have another. Uh, I have another underwriter. We got two this week. What's great is that time will pass quickly if you purchase the new cockroach racing track. That's right. Run, little cockroach, run. A new craze hitting America. These, Apparently, <laughs> these kids between the ages of ten and fifteen are looking at the internet. The internet gives them access to the whole world, and they can see that thanks to climate change, Europe is eating cockroaches. Yes, <laughs> yes. They don't want to do that. It's very dangerous. Uh, it's all in the preparation, too, by the way, kids. Um, let's Actually, move on. Fantastic sources of protein without any preparation. As well, as, <laughs> maybe two or three people listening to the show will have been long term deep country travelers and they'll know that. <laughs> Can I get you a donut, Steve? <laughs> Can I get you some microplastics? There are only no microplastics in your roach, more than likely. Um, yeah. well, famously, <laughs> just... As we've discussed on this channel before, famously, a multi-million dollar probe was sent to the very bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest trench on Earth, and they found plastic bags. Whoo, that's bad. So, yeah, these little microbes are everywhere. These little oh, microplastics are everywhere. Uh, well, <laughs> it can only get better because it can't get worse. Um, number four on our list, or should I say, number four on our list after a long distance dedication is Eric Larson's The Demon of Unrest. Steve, what do you know about that one? Well, this is, as you can see from the cover, this is about the, the uh, a group of traders firing on Fort Sumter and yeah. starting the American Civil War. And there's a pro and a con to this book. <laughs> yes. So it's all about that. And there's, there's a pro and a con to this book. Yes. The, the con is that... Uh, Eric Larson chooses to center his narrative on one particular person, and that person is not interesting. There's a reason mm. why no one's ever centered a narrative on him before. He's not interesting. The con is that Eric Larson could make your tray of donuts interesting. He is <laughs> yeah, the absolutely. best selling popular historian for a reason. He's, yeah. you, you know what you're getting, and you will not be disappointed. My, my fear in him releasing this book now, and it being popular, is that potentially a certain group could use this as an instruction manual? Well, that's part of the reason for its popularity is that mm. there's all sorts of widespread talk of a civil war mm -hmm. uh, or of a massive insurrection by what once upon a time the press referred to as Yal Qaeda. <laughs> uh, they don't so much do that anymore now that Yal Qaeda has a blood count. Uh, yeah. But still, yeah, a book, it's a little bit un uh, un unnerving that a book yeah. about Ameri the start of an American civil war is popular now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a little bit unnerving. The responsibility of releasing it now, which I guess, you know, you can't put that on a publisher because these things are planned years in advance. But uh, and yeah. it, you, if Eric Larson comes to you and says, I've got a new project, you're going to say yes. Yes, you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I like money. <laughs> We're going to release that. So there we go. Uh, no, so that was a that was kind of a quasi recommendation there, I think, for the theme you know, of unrest. You with Eric Larson. If you like yeah. him, you will like this book. Excellent. Cool. All right. And finally, number five on our list, uh, new this week on the list is by uh, a great name, Fawn Weaver. And this is Love and Whiskey. And this is a portrayal of the bond between Jack Daniel and the African American distiller nearest green. What's going on here, Steve? We're getting a little I boozy. I read this book. Okay. I, okay. I mean, nothing about it at all. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I'm rather fond of a rain barrel full of cheap red wine when I have company here, but <laughs> hard liquor, whiskey. I've never seen the appeal. Never. It's it's well, it doesn't taste good. That's the interesting thing about it. Good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't really. make you do good things. It doesn't make no. you feel good <laughs> the next day or the next week. I've never understood it. I know that that uh you know the the arm the elbow patch armchair guys will say, Oh, you sit and you sip. <laughs> Uh, I'm Boston Irish Catholic, and I don't see the point of sipping out. No. <laughs> I've never sipped my Ovaltine. I don't know, I don't know yeah. about you, Steve. That doesn't make any sense at all. What do you mean no. you're sipping it? <laughs> but uh, so, and if you drink it instead of sipping it, and I've noticed that all of those, you know, ostentatious beard women belong barefoot in the kitchen guys that say that whiskey should be sipped. I've noticed that they don't. They drink it. Yeah. Even <laughs> it. So, yes. But, I, I've never understood the appeal, and maybe I'm just shallow enough a reader so that I need some sort of a toehold. Yeah, in order well, to read, I wouldn't. I wouldn't read. I doubt that I would read this book unless it's, yeah. unless I get word from 
you know, other critics that it's really good despite its subject matter. Sure, sure. And well, I, and it, it looks like it's the unification of this, uh, you know, uh, this nearest green dis distiller and, you know, um, and Jack. So I think there's some cultural stuff going on here that may be interesting, uh, that maybe well, won't right. well, well, it, it sounds like it's the study of uh, a black owned business that did well. Yeah. And those stores are always great. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're always underdog stories. Certainly, they're, certainly. They're, they're underdog stories in a way that American readers don't want to remember. But if you're a black man in America or a black woman in America and you try to start a business outside yeah. the black community, you'll encounter it same now as you did 70 years ago. Certainly, certainly. You encounter amazing amounts of object, of obstacles that shouldn't be there. They shouldn't be they don't there. don't have anything yeah. to do with your business model. Right, right. You know? yeah. And we, 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 in America, we have done a fairly good job of raising our consciousness about institutional racism uh no. casual racism if you were in a group of an all-white group of people in an elevator or at a, a book club yeah yeah someone made an overtly racist comment the whole room would stop and that person would not be welcomed back and that wasn't yeah. true 60 years ago that wasn't true <laughs> yeah it's true ago. it's true now yeah. it is true i don't yeah. think there's anywhere in the country where that wouldn't happen you wouldn't be welcomed back everyone would yeah. stop there's no such thing as taking that casually anymore and i that's good, and we should be happy about that. But I think it blinds us sometimes to how prevalent racism still is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would. I haven't read this book, but I'd be willing to bet that if Nearest Green had been white operated, they would mm -hmm. have a drastically different story. And there was there wouldn't be a book. There, there would be no need for one. There wouldn't be a need for one. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Oh my. Well, there we are. That's the top five best selling. And you're wink, telling wink. me that the fact that these things are on the New York Times bestseller list makes a difference. Uh, not only does it make a difference, Peterburg, Wisconsin. Oh, it's our buying list. I mean, I start. Oh, I mean, I should say that I start actually with something called a ratio report because we're in a library of 33, 33 libraries. So um, we all have to kind of uh, they have a computerized list that basically uh, tow your own weight, please, because we're all sharing. So that's really interesting. We should talk about that because it's, it's a really interesting thing that it's not like a it's not really a trade secret. I, you know, I think some people might regard it as oh, you're giving away all the goods. And it's like, no, um, but if our a patron only video. I'm glad you mentioned patron only video. And what is Steve talking about? A little sick of our exclusive dance routine. I might <laughs> want something with more substantial content. <laughs> We're going to get there, I swear to God. Uh, but that being said, if you find your, you know, as you're crawling around the dark oh. web. <laughs> <laughs> and you find yourself at patreon.com forward slash books of the week you'll see our mugs on it and uh not mugs but uh mug faces <laughs> and um maybe we'll maybe we'll sell mugs eventually but right now um, um and you can drop a little coin in the kitty you know a little in the tip jar and uh it what happens with that wonderful coin is that it all lands not on Steve's head, but um, uh, to the friends. You know, I tried to extract an exorbitant cut from the Patreon dough, and <laughs> uh, my producer flashed up the faces of those ladies. <laughs> was all I to get my hand out of the cookie jar. Yeah, Steve's <laughs> hand is still a little red <laughs> from the slap. You don't want to cross those ladies. <laughs> no. you know, a ruler on the knuckles is never fun. <laughs> so, um, but uh, all the Coin goes to the friends of the Cedarburg Public Library who make this show possible. <laughs> Maybe that's not a selling point, but um, they make CPL Radio possible and just the very core of our library possible. And uh, we love them. Also, oh, there's more. Well, do you know who you have some information? Like Steve. those Marvel superheroes of yore, one member of the uh, friends of the Cedarburg Public Library was also spawned by radiation. <laughs> and it's not the one you think. <laughs> That must be the one I warm my hands to in the morning when she comes They're in. They're all in deep Freudian therapy because of the show. <laughs> right. Have you seen books of the week this week? <laughs> That's us. Can't we avoid them? <laughs> we can't deny them. Can't one, them. two, <laughs> three, four. <laughs> We like to call that our greatest hits. <laughs> so there we are. You younger people, if you're part of the anxious generation, tune into the show. <laughs> Not only will you come out of every episode with a smile, but the smile will be widened by the fact that you'll be able to look back on the last half hour and say, well, at least I'm not them. <laughs> I'm not, I have not yet hit rock bottom. <laughs> now that's a service we provide here. All right, everybody. Books of the week. The week is over. That means Steve's going to start reading again, and we are going to exploit all of that here on Books of the Week. And thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you to Steve. Um, and, you know, get yourself back to Dunkin' Donuts. I hear they serve lunch, too. My destination today is the Battle of Antietam. 
Oh, all day long. Well, great. <laughs> well, keep low, and uh, you know, <laughs> we'll hope for the best. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs> bye, bye.